Okay. Who is Stefan Klassen, the economist? Where is your interest in development economics coming from? And more specifically, where is your interest in gender studies or in the role of women in development coming from? Okay, so I've um, had a long-standing interest in uh, development issues that already started when I was a student uh, in the United States in the late 1980s. Uh, certainly I was quite influenced by studying with Amartya Sen, uh, who is a leading um, development economist um, and Nobel Pri later on Nobel Prize winner, um, who made a very big impression on me, but uh, in general my motivation has always been to uh, think about um, kind of this question of global inequality and why some people and some regions and some countries are doing worse and what uh, can be done about this. The um, issues relating to gender inequality, um, uh, I got interested during my PhD studies uh, when I was made aware of this uh, serious problems of gender bias and mortality in parts of the developing world, in particular in China and India and um, other parts of, the, uh, parts of the Middle East. And that's where I got uh, interested in analyzing this phenomenon. And uh, as a result, I kind of specialized more and more in these questions on uh, gender gaps, both the causes as well as the measurement, as well as the consequences for development outcomes of these. Uh, gender gaps. Okay. The world has embarked on a difficult journey of uh, debate in order to define the new strategy of development, the so-called uh, post-2015 development agenda. But in this process you have stressed the need to overcome the current measure of income poverty based on the $1.25 international poverty line. You have suggested the need to embrace a new internationally coordinated and consistent measurement of poverty at the national level. Could you explain very briefly uh, why this proposal should be taken into account? And if so, what would be the main difficulties in adopting this measure? Okay, so first to just briefly uh, mention the um, concerns I have with the um, dollar a day measure. There are uh, several concerns. One is the uh, kind of inherent instability of this measure because it depends on these so-called purchasing power paris uh, parity comparisons that take place every uh, every few years. And um, uh, last time these uh, comparisons were done in 2008, we suddenly then learned that uh, income poverty was much larger than we had thought. And um, so all of what we had known about income poverty um, had been called into question. The second um, problem is that the dollar a day poverty measure is very low and becomes increasingly irrelevant for a rising number of countries in the world. And so that is maybe no longer such a useful reference point uh, for a large number of countries. And the third one is that the dollar a day has no linkage to uh, national poverty measurement. Many countries have um, uh, income poverty measures at the national level and they're using them and these are very important for policy purposes and the dollar a day measure has no direct linkage to these national poverty measures. So th my idea is uh, then to say um, how about um, to avoid these instabilities that we have with this dollar a day uh, measure and um, uh, we do the following. We coordinate the way we set poverty lines um, across um, the world in a sense that they should be developed on a consistent methodology but using national currencies. And then, um, uh, and one consistent methodology would be um, to use the so called cost of basic needs approach to uh, measuring um, income poverty, where you basically say, those people are poor who do not have sufficient resources to buy a, a bundle of goods that allows them to be adequately nourished. And um, so that um, one could use that and implement that in different countries of the world using national household surveys in national currency. And so the poverty lines would be poverty lines in national currency. Um, and would be directly relevant to the national poverty debates, but at the same time, I could just then aggregate the number of poor people and the poverty rate across countries using that. Um, now, of course, there are lots of technical and some conceptual and political issues that need to be addressed. Uh, on the uh, technical issues um, um, are the question, well, do we have other surveys that are being used in different countries? Are they comparable enough to have 
a consistent poverty line across countries. Sometimes mm -hmm. the surveys are more detailed, sometimes they're less detailed, sometimes they're income surveys like in much of Latin America, sometimes they're more expenditure surveys like in much of Africa. And um, <clears throat> so the question is how can we make them um, uh, consistent? So that is a, a technical challenge. There's also the question of how do we update the poverty line over time um, as countries get richer uh, and how can we do that in a consistent way? That's another challenge. There, of course, are uh, more kind of political challenges. Um, in some sort of sense, the um, many countries, you know, have an income poverty line that they've chosen for good political reasons, um, and um, they will likely want to stick to that uh, and not necessarily change that because it's not consistent with the way poverty is measured in other countries. So um, here, I would say, well, one would need a two-stage process. In some sort of sense, first one could just say, okay. Um, we just we create by, by technocrats basically a con comparable and consistent poverty line across countries to measure poverty this way. And then in a second step, which will be a much longer step, countries can decide uh, to think about whether they actually want to adopt these more consistent poverty lines across countries or whether they want to stick to what they have. The idea is a little bit um, to do this similarly to the system of national accounts, where in a sense... Um, countries have decided to adopt a system of a consistent way of measuring GDP um, mm -hmm. and um, using a, a kind of uh, agreed manual that all countries are following. Um, and the idea would be to say, let's do something similar for poverty measurement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what's your position regarding the need to embrace policy strategies uh, based on global public goods? There is a new... Uh, trend in, in the US about this topic? Well, in general, of course, um, development progress depends on uh, a variety of global public goods um, and of people and institutions providing these global public goods. Um, so some of them are kind of very well defined um, that um, are, for example, um, knowledge to combat diseases are global public goods um, that uh, once this knowledge is generated it is available to everybody and uh, therefore we need to make sure that there are incentives to generate this knowledge. Now of course we have a usual system of doing that, a patent system mm -hmm. that uh, um, uh, in the case of pharmaceuticals um, generates incentives to uh, produce this but there then the problem is that uh, Uh, it does, uh, these patents are uh, lead to costly medicines and uh, sometimes unaffordable medicines, and uh, so there is an access problem. So here uh, the question then is uh, the international community can try to say well, we need a different system of incentives, um, maybe provided by public funds, for example, for the provision of these um, uh, global public goods in the field of health. Um, and um, this way we can solve the, the incentive problem, which still is there, and the access problem. Um, of course, there are other uh, global public goods relating to um, climate change, which of course is uh, the, an, a very big important global problem where all of us are contributing to it, some more than others, um, and uh, a solution will only work if the majority of those countries uh, or the majority of emissions um, uh, are included in any uh, deal and once again international cooperation is important in, in this area. Um, a third area is peace and uh, security where uh, in a sense um, the, um, the peace in the neighboring country um, is important for you, uh, for, the, for all its neighbors. Um, But I wouldn't want to say that the development agenda should be purely focused on global public goods. There are some areas where global public goods are extremely important, but there are many other areas where it continues to be the case that um, development progress will depend very much on what can individual countries do and how they do it, and uh, on the policy environment they create, the investments that they make, and so on. So um, uh, I would not uh, suggest that... Um, Um, global public goods are uh, the only way to promote development. Um, they are important in certain areas. Mm. There is a parallel debate in development in which there is much stress on the topic of policy coherence for mm -hmm. development in order to tackle the many challenges of development around the world. How do you see this approach in the current geopolitical and geoeconomical context 
Is this approach the best viable uh, way forward or the specialists in development should propose less ambitious targets? Well, the, clearly the lack of policy coherence is a major problem. So um, uh, that on the one hand uh, we provide aid to countries, on the other hand we don't provide market access uh, to some of their goods. Um, and, or uh, on the one hand we provide uh, aid to countries, on the other hand uh, we don't do anything when uh, a conflict erupts and, uh, and decades of development progress gets, uh, gets wiped away in, uh, in a very short while. So um, uh, policy coherence is important, of course it's a huge challenge to do this um, and, uh, and I think the role of academics and, um, uh, and um, others working in the development field is just to push for um, governments to take this up as a serious issue. Now I know that that won't uh, lead to solutions immediately, but um, I think um, there has been it has been recognized. For example, I think in Europe, including at the Euro uh, European level, at the European Commission level, that um, um, policy coherence is just a very important uh, area that they need to focus on, um, so that um, they really have to think about when they're thinking about trade policy they should make sure is our trade policy consistent with our aid policy is our migration policy consistent with our uh, trade and our aid policy and uh, so i think um, something has been achieved in the sense that uh, policy makers are much more aware of the issues and see how important uh, these linkages are uh, of course it's politically difficult to then achieve coherence and um, that is a challenge that I think will remain but that doesn't mean uh, that we should be less ambitious in calling for it. Mm, you have mentioned that the post-2015 development agenda is not the right place to approach the issue of inequality and therefore that uh, the development agenda do not need an MDG for inequality. Given the relevance uh, or the growing relevance of inequality in the international arena, are you still convinced that inequality must be set aside? I'm not arguing that inequality must be set aside. I'm, uh, what I'm saying is that um, um, in terms of the particular goals and indicators and targets for the post-2015 development agenda, one should focus on um, lessening deprivations of and improving the quality of life of those uh, whose quality of life is worst in the fields of education, in fields of health, in the fields of um, uh, security and uh, in the fields of incomes. So those are the things that I think should be the focus. Inequality of course matters for that a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, progress in health is much easier if inequality is lower. Progress in education is much easier if inequality is lower. Income poverty uh, reduction is much easier if inequality is lower. In fact, that's a mathematical relationship. So uh, the lower inequality is, the lower is income poverty, and the uh, larger is the impact of any income growth on poverty. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, inequality matters a lot uh, mm -hmm. for um, the development agenda that I propose. Um, and uh, therefore, it is one of the important means to achieve progress in these indicators. So the question only is um, uh, then should we have a separate goal that um, uh, uh, examines inequality? And there I'm a little bit uh, more uh, dubious, mainly on political and strategic grounds, that basically I think it will be quite hard to come up with a good consensus of um, what the right level of inequality is and how it should be reduced um, and uh, there will be different value judgments and, uh, and many countries will feel that this is a rather intrusive um, goal. Um, so there I would think that um, it is not necessary and not strategically useful to have a separate goal on inequality. If one however says we want to focus on lessening deprivations it is quite clear that lowering inequality will be an important issue, mm. lowering national inequality. Now, of course, another thing one could do is to uh, have a goal on lowering global inequality, 
Now that I think is very um, complicated because um, uh, again um, the most important uh, way to lower global inequality is, is if poor countries grow faster um, and um, that of course will again be an important means to achieving all of those other goals but um, uh, I think um, a goal on global inequality kind of gives the impression that there's some sort of zero-sum game mm. that we are playing. Um, and, um, and I don't think that's the impression one wants to give. Mm, broadly speaking, how your perception of the process of development has changed through the years, taking into account the evolution of global capitalism? Are you technically optimistic, but politically pessimistic? Just optimist about the uh, global development challenges? or none of the both? Well, generally, I think there are many reasons why one can be very optimistic about um, uh, global development. Um, if we basically think about um, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, basically, uh, uh, and we looked at the developing world, we basically saw that, yes, there were a few countries that were doing quite well. There was just the, the few East Asian tigers then, uh, just South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Um, and um, the rest of the developing world was either in crisis and stagnation or sometimes even in regress. Now, if uh, then in the 80s, we already saw that, you know, many more Asian countries uh, started growing very rapidly and have kind of joined um, the, uh, uh, the rush for growth that has taken place, most notably, of course, China as well. And um, in the um, 90s, uh, growth re uh, and poverty reduction returned to Latin America, um, mm -hmm. somewhat slower in the 90s and more impressive in the 2000s. And we now also saw since the late 90s that growth has started on average in Africa. Poverty reduction has taken place there. So um, I think um, the world looks a lot better now than it did 25 years ago. And, uh, and in fact, um, some of the development successes that we've seen in the developing world were nearly unthinkable 30, 40 years ago. So um, I think uh, we've done um, actually remarkably well in that sense. Um, at the same time, of course, um, the um, many basic challenges have not been solved for those who are uh, uh, lagging behind. Uh, so, for example, I think in, in Latin America, uh, we've seen quite a lot of progress, not only on growth and poverty reduction, but also on inequality reduction. But it's still very, very high. And it's still unclear to me and um, whether Latin America is on a sustainable path towards a much lower inequality, which ultimately will be necessary for a stable political and social system. And in Africa, I think there are many challenges still. So uh, yes, they've had uh, 10 good years, but they're still very undiversified economies. Um, we don't know how long uh, this boom will last. Um, uh, both politically, there are still many challenges. Economically, there are still many challenges. Uh, so um, I think uh, we are far from um, the development business is far from um, uh, has achieved its functions and uh, ensured that development takes place everywhere. But I think what's interesting, of course, is because we now have all these development successes, we can learn from them as well as from the failures uh, to see what uh, how to promote development better. So I think. Uh, in general, it's an exciting period, and I think um, there are great opportunities. Um, of course, there are also some risks. Okay. Um, this is my last question. Um, how do you imagine the future of development economics in, let's say, 20 years? Which should be, according to you, the main areas for action in the discipline in the following years? Well, it's quite unclear how development economics will uh, develop. Um, now, we've seen in the last 10 years, development economics, particularly in the United States, has um, f uh, taken a very, very strong kind of focus on more micro-level uh, assessments, in particular thinking about impact assessments, randomized controlled trials, uh, on trying to understand what kind of policy interventions work at the more micro level, because these are the only ones that you can really uh, evaluate using these methods. So um, I think that has been very useful to think uh, much harder about um, what policies work, um, what programs work, and I think that's useful for governments and so on. I think at the same time, uh, 
the usefulness will will diminish and um, many of the more bigger questions of um, um, how to um, generate uh, institutions that promote long-term growth and poverty reduction, um, how to ensure that um, you actually make the transition from a resource-based economy to an uh, 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 industrially-based economy, um, how to manage your public finances um, given that you are a natural resource exporter and so on. So I think the, those more bigger questions about institutions, macro policy, macro strategy, trade policy, um, will become uh, bigger again and they have I think in many ways already become bigger and I see um, some more um, um, uh, move uh, towards that direction and I think in particular this question of the industrialization challenge um, mm. is going to be a, a very big one because I think um, um, neither in Latin America where outside of Brazil, Mexico, Argentina and maybe a little bit in Colombia, um, the industrialization challenge has not really been um, met. Um, you know, you have some maquiladoras at the, in Central America, but um, uh, many uh, the, the biggest growth boom in the last 10, 15 years has actually been resource-based growth. Um, and the question is, is that a sustainable development model in the long term? That question is even more urgent in Africa, where basically mm. outside of South Africa, we don't really have any economy that has moved in a major way towards uh, uh, industrialization, towards manufacturing. And so those, I think, will be very, very important challenges. Thank you very much. Okay.